Welcome everyone to our Bunkey Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Um, on behalf of all my partners at the Bunkey Clinic, I'd like to welcome you. Um, this morning, we are delighted to have a, a very close friend of ours who's just down the road at Stanford, Dr. Arash Momeni, um, who will be talking to us about optimizing outcomes in uh, autologous breast recon reconstruction. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes uh, going over uh, Dr. Momeni's background. Um, he graduated magna cum laude from Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany. He then studied plastic, he's then completed plastic and reconstructive surgery residency and hand surgery in Freiburg, Germany. So he was fully trained um, and then did additional training in plastic surgery at Stanford, um, followed by a microsurgery fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. So he is the most trained person I personally know. Uh, <laughs> and, and you're going to see the results of it. So very, very talented surgeon. Um, Dr. Momeni is recognized nationally and inter internationally for his research and clinical outcomes in evidence-based medicine. Um, at a very young age, he has published already over 170 peer-reviewed papers. Um, so this is an, an, an incredible uh, number of, of papers for anyone, even for someone who has been in practice for 30 or 40 years, uh, let alone someone who's been in practice for less than five. Um, because of this um, and many of his academic endeavors, he is the Ryan Upson Scholar in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Stanford. He is very um, academically active in reviewing papers. He reviews papers for PRS, JPRAS, JRM, as well as Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Uh, he's an associate editor uh, for the Annals of Plastic Surgery, and he is on the editorial board um, of uh, Microsurgery, the European Journal, uh, and, and the European Journal of, of Plastic Surgery. On a personal level, we actually were uh, delighted to have Dr. Momini visit us last year when people could actually visit, and we, we uh, hosted him as visiting professor for us. This was a lot of fun, and, and the fellows got a lot out of it. Dr. Momeni is really um, a, truly a triple threat. He is not only a consummate clinician and an, an extremely busy surgeon clinically, um, as you saw, he's also very, very accomplished from a research standpoint, and he is a consummate educator. Um, and he was awarded the Leslie Hoving Teaching Award at Stanford, um, which is a, a very coveted award. Um, goes to one at faculty every year. Um, and he received this in the 08, sorry, 18, 19 year. Um, so much deserved there. On a personal level, I've gotten to know Dr. Momeni very well over the last uh, decade or so, and I consider him one of my closest friends, and it's really a delight to, to host him uh, as part of the series. So with that, Arash, thank you so much for being with us. I know you're quite busy, and you have a busy clinic just after this, um, so we do appreciate you being here with us. I'm going to make you the presenter now, and uh, hopefully we should be able to see your desktop. Thank you very much, Bob. It is a true honor to uh, be invited uh, to uh, give a lecture. I just, um, <clears throat> when when the whole lecture series started, I looked at the list of presenters and it is uh, nothing but humbling uh, when you see the list of uh, visiting professors and faculty that you were able to assemble. Um, it is uh, truly a privilege to come back to where I train because as part of the training program at Stanford, we do rotate at the Bunkey Clinic, and I think without question, that is the most fruitful, that was for me the most fruitful experience um, that I recall from my uh, training years. And obviously I do value the close friendship I have with every one of you at the Bunkey Clinic. Um, with that, what I wanted to talk about today is um, something that I do clinically uh, quite a bit of, uh, which is uh, breast reconstruction. And uh, can everybody see the slides okay? Yep, it looks great. Fantastic. And we can and, also see your we can see your pointer as well. So if you want to use that to point to things, we can see that. Fantastic. So um, when 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 you talk about breast reconstruction, you can uh, basically just say you know autologous or implant based reconstruction. But everybody who knows me knows that I uh, have a, uh, a strong interest and also history. And it is quite remarkable what we have accomplished over the past uh, decades. When you look at the first implant-based reconstruction result that was published in PRS uh, in 1971, it is obviously galaxies away from what we can accomplish today in 2020 quite reliably. And so we took something that the authors claimed did not produce any cosmetic triumphs and truly can provide the patient an outcome that is cosmetically appealing considering that this patient on the right underwent bilateral mastectomies. And I think the same can be said about uh, autologous reconstruction, 
uh, whereas the result of autologous reconstruction in 79 following the uh, free uh, uh, tram flap was obviously better than with implant-based reconstruction uh, but fortunately we were able to improve our surgical technique and our approaches to then have a patient such as this one on the right hand side who underwent bilateral nipple sparing mastectomy and free uh, DIAP flap reconstruction and these are reliable outcomes that we can accomplish and what I'm going to go over today are pain points that I experienced in my practice and areas that I continue to struggle with that I think that uh, should resonate also with um, folks who do a lot of breast reconstruction um, because there are things that we still haven't quite figured out and I'm going to try to highlight some of those issues. Uh, whenever you think about breast reconstruction, you have to think about what is it that we try to accomplish. And I think what we try to accomplish is a satisfied patient, a happy patient, a patient that has a high level uh, of uh, satisfaction with respect to the restoration that took place. And there is uh, progressively data being published about the value of reconstruction, but not only of the value of reconstruction, but also the implications of the various reconstructive approaches. And specifically, when you think of abdominal flap-based reconstruction, satisfaction rates higher than what can be achieved and accomplished even with breast conservation have been reported, and that is quite remarkable. Naturally, when you look at patients who undergo no mass and no reconstruction, the um, satisfaction rates are quite low. And that is not surprising. If you really look at a patient such as this one who underwent right mastectomy and no reconstruction, and compare that to a patient who underwent bilateral mastectomy and reconstruction, it doesn't take a scientist to acknowledge that the patient on the right-hand side uh, is perhaps going to have a higher level of satisfaction. When we talk to our residents and fellows, um, we try to kind of teach the concept of plastic surgery as a principle-based specialty. And I think the same holds true in breast reconstruction. So when you really break down what the goals are that we try to accomplish in breast reconstruction, I think that they can be summarized as the five S. So you want to create breasts that are of adequate size, of adequate shape and symmetry. Ideally, they should be soft. So absence of fat necrosis or capsule contracture as it pertains to implant-based reconstruction. And ideally, they should be sensate. And you want to accomplish all this uh, adhering to the guiding principle in medicine, which is do no harm. So you want to minimize morbidity to the greatest extent possible. When thinking after, uh, of reconstructive options following mastectomy, in general, we perceive that to be a binary decision-making process. So either patients are offered implant-based reconstruction or they're offered autologous reconstruction. And I'm gonna talk more about autologous reconstruction today. We have figured out how to transfer tissue from A to B. So flap loss rate is really not that much of an issue. And we have uh, about 1%, sometimes less than 1% of the 1.5% flap loss rates in larger series. So I think that is a testament to the reliability of this reconstructive modality. When thinking about the donor site morbidity, there's obviously an ongoing debate and controversy as to should you, do, should you be doing free muscle sparing tram flaps or free DIAP flaps. But I think a lot of studies have attested to the fact that the difference might not be significant, particularly with improved closure techniques such as incorporation of mesh in the abdominal wall closure. Uh, it basically levels the differences between MS tram and DIAP flap. So when you go back to this slide, and we will be repeatedly coming back to this slide to illustrate a few take-home messages, if you will, the question has to be reversed by saying, what, does, what do patients see and what do they feel? And naturally, what they see and feel are breasts of adequate size, shape, symmetry. They will feel whether the breast is soft or not. Sensation is the point of our ongoing research, and I will illustrate a few points to that effect. But what every patient will see is a scar. Um, as well as possibly the disruption of the aesthetic unit of the abdomen. And that obviously weighs substantially heavier than the issue related to bulges and hernias because those occur with a low single digit percentage rate. The shift from surgeon-centric to patient-centric approaches is not only happening or has not only happened in the clinical realm, but also with respect to uh, scholarly activities and research we now progressively are seeing high impact journals publish articles that focus on patient reported outcomes as opposed to such as my last 
20 cases. So these are the five pain points or challenges, problems that I've incur encountered in my practice. Uh, and I think that anyone who does breast reconstruction fairly uh, routinely will have come across any or all of these complications. And that is fat necrosis, the inability to preserve the nipple areola complex, a high abdominal scar. And if you critically look at images of patients, Following autologous reconstruction, you will see that the scars are rather high. Poor projection, I think nothing is less uh, satisfying or uh, uh, more depressing after you spend five, six hours doing a bilateral reconstruction and then you look at the patient post-op and you wonder where all that tissue went. Um, and then lack of sensory, uh, um, lack of sensation or the inability to restore sensation. And we'll talk about those. So starting with fat necrosis, the first article that really addressed this issue was out of Houston uh, by Stephen Kroll, who uh, compared tram flaps with DIP flaps. And what he noticed was that in DIP flaps, the rate of fat necrosis was higher. And what he then postulated was that the blood supply to some of the DIP flaps is perhaps significantly less robust than a standard a free tram flap. And that is a timely discussion because in the early 90s, we saw the advent of DIP flaps, and so that was uh, more and more becoming on vogue. We do know that perforator numbers predict the incidence of fat necrosis, and there is a series of very well done studies, one of them being uh, this study out of Houston, that attests to the fact that the number of perforators included in your flap to some degree predicts the incidence of fat necrosis. But not only that, it is also the distribution of these perforators within the flap itself. In a very elegant study in 2018, Lee and colleagues uh, classified uh, DIP flaps based on the vertical entry of the perforator into the flap. And they categorized it in one, two, and three, meaning central entry, eccentric entry, and multiple perforators entry. And that is not only of academic interest, but has actually clinical implications as the centrally located uh, perforator is associated with a significantly lower fat necrosis rate of basically 10% versus over 30% in an eccentrically located perforator. And the area of fat necrosis is distal to the site of perforator entry. We then saw a very nicely done article out of BI Deaconess by Bernie Lee and colleagues looking at medial versus lateral row perforators. And not surprisingly, in bilateral DIP flap reconstructions, the more eccentrically located perforator relative to the flap, as in the medial perforator, was associated with a significantly higher rate of fat necrosis, as in basically a quarter of flaps versus less than 10%. So if you look at the entirety of the literature, I think it is safe to say that we are facing a fat necrosis rate of at least 10% following autologous breast reconstruction. Now, why is that important and why am I saying all this? Well, one of the main goals that we have is to reconstruct breasts of adequate softness and the inability to create that and the result in fat necrosis that occurs is associated with anxiety. If you consider that these patients are cancer patients and if they feel a lump, that obviously is a uh, source of uh, concern for them. Commonly, these patients desire additional procedures and with the removal of volume following breast reconstruction, the result can be an inferior aesthetic outcome. And so if you're really provocative, you basically have to say that we encounter partial reconstructive failures in over 10% of our patients, and that is in the hands of true masters of uh, the specialty, um, because I would argue that nobody uh, would inset a flap that uh, they know is not adequately vascularized. Given these numbers, I think that that presents an opportunity for technology to improve clinical outcomes in breast reconstruction as clinical judgment does not appear to be sufficient to guide us in our decision-making which parts of the flap to its size and which ones to leave behind. And so the question that we posed was, can perfusion imaging technology add value to the quality of healthcare delivery by reducing post-operative complications? And what uh, I propose is that we depart from the traditional use of technology, which typically has been 
external Dopplers, implantable Dopplers, bioptics and the like, because these technologies, while important and while should be used, but should be uh, supplemented with additional technology, uh, these uh, measures merely give you an, a binary outcome or provide an answer to the question is the anastomosis patent or not. But we already know that anastomotic problems are quite rare, um, roughly around 1%, whereas fat necrosis is at least 10%. So we need technology that displays perfusion gradually. And what I use is ICG imaging. There is a variety of different systems that you can use. I'm not going to go into the uh, basics of this, but essentially you can inject ICG repeatedly over the course of the operation and it tells you areas of uh, tissue that are well perfused. And there are studies that have demonstrated correlation of findings on ICG imaging with clinical outcomes. Um, one of my mentors here at Stanford, Jeff Gertner, actually published uh, one of the early studies uh, on the ability to predict areas of mastectomy skin flap necrosis using ICG imaging and ushered an era of multiple studies being published on the use of ICG imaging in the context of mastectomy skin flap necrosis. So, so that we know, and it does make sense, if you look at this illustration on a, of a, a nipple sparing mastectomy, it does make sense that as you move towards the distal edge of the flap, perfusion becomes less robust. And now when you look on the right-hand side uh, at the CIP flap, it is uh, very easy to imagine that as you move away from the perforator entry, the area of the, the flap is going to be less reliably perfused. And it would be nice to actually see that on the table before you set the flap. And so this is how this flap looks. It was a delayed reconstruction. And you can see basically that the ICG contrast essentially lights up the flap at the side of the perforator entry, kind of like a starburst pattern. And you will see a homogeneously well perfused flap throughout. And the question is, how do you get there? Because if you do it by clinical examination only, you will see that the dermis will probably bleed almost throughout the flap. Well, you use ICG imaging after anastomosis to guide the area where you make your incision and excise everything that is not well perfused. And then you get from something that is not homo homogeneously perfused to something that you know will reliably have adequate perfusion throughout the flap. So we, we do know that um, ICG imaging has been used to determine free flap perfusion in the past. And it was in small studies, NF8 by Martin Newman in 2009. And then there was, as part of a larger study out of Duke, where nine patients were included with breast reconstruction, as well as five DIP flaps. But none of these experiences and reports looked at a quantitative analysis of the impact of ICG imaging on outcomes in breast reconstruction. And so, what we sought out to do is to determine if image-guided flap debridement or flap excision is associated with a reduced incidence of fat necrosis postoperatively following autologous breast reconstruction. And the primary outcome was fat necrosis, and we defined it as a palpable that is greater than one centimeter mass at three months post-op. I say intentionally what the definition was because depending on the study, we have different definitions of fat necrosis. Some use ultrasound, some use MRI uh, or other uh, imaging technology. But uh, we focused on clinical, clinically palpable, because that is what patients feel and that is what is most distressing to them. And we uh, categorized it in two groups. So those uh, in whom we uh, excise flap based on clinical assessment versus ICG imaging. And in this early res uh, report, we looked at uh, 137 flaps in 80 patients, uh, almost 80 underwent standard care, and almost 60 underwent ICG guided excision. Uh, with respect to baseline uh, uh, characteristics, there was really no significant difference between the two, as in age, BMI, uh, history of radiation. But what we did see was a significant difference in fat necrosis rates, as in using clinical judgment only. Uh, translated into a fat necrosis rate of 21.5% um, versus less than 5% using ICG imaging. Now, one can argue that uh, we may have overexcised as a result of the ICG imaging, but I think it is very difficult to overcome an odds ratio of 0.11, which basically means a tenfold reduction in the incidence of fat necrosis following use of uh, imaging technology to guide your decision making. Um, 
do I now say that we should be using ICG imaging on every patient who undergoes a free flap? Naturally not. Uh, I think that there are some high-risk uh, categories where it is at least prudent to think about using additional uh, tools to guide our decision-making intraoperatively. Now, what are those high-risk scenarios? I believe that those are single perforator DIP flaps, uh, flaps with an eccentric perforator entry, because we do know that this area distal from the uh, perforator entry is prone to undergoing fat necrosis, and heavy flaps. And um, I basically am taking an arbitrary cutoff of 800 grams. I think 800 gram is a sizable flap. And anything greater than 800, uh, I will uh, use ICG imaging to guide my decision making intraoperatively. So that addresses the fat necrosis portion. Uh, now to nipple or really complex preservation. I think this patient illustrates it quite nicely. If you just look at the breast shape that was reconstructed, it actually looks quite good. But obviously, the absence of a nipple or really complex is disruptive and disturbing to the eye when you examine this patient, not only as a surgeon, but also for the patient. Um, and interestingly, we now see our breast surgery colleagues progressively focus on the cosmetic results and sequelae of their ablative treatment. And so it is important for plastic surgeons to partner with the breast surgeons to kind of steer them in the right direction. Because when you read the breast surgery literature, sometimes there are some, uh, let's say, interesting approaches to improving the aesthetic outcome of breasts um, as part of their ablative treatment. We do know of the uh, valuable uh, result following uh, nipple reconstruction. We do know that it uh, correlates with an improvement in uh, patient satisfaction after nipple areola complex reconstruction has been performed. So when you now are proposing nipple sparing mastectomy, the first question that you have to answer is, is it oncologically safe? And I think that in numerous studies in controlled settings, we've been able to demonstrate that it is oncologically safe if you have a negative intraoperative or areola frozen section. But that is now in, in controlled settings. How is it in the real world? And this was an uh, article published out of Stanford by Alison Kurian, who uh, demonstrated in a large population-based study that there is no evidence of worse survival uh, after nipple sparing mastectomy in a real world setting. So I think um, honoring oncologic criteria, it is safe to proceed with nipple sparing mastectomy. And so then the next question that is important is, does it actually result in the desired outcome, as in superior quality of life? And this study, as well as several other studies, have demonstrated that. If you look at this, the breast cue was used here, and we looked at, or the authors looked at, um, two different cohorts, those who underwent nipple sparing mastectomy and those who underwent non-nipple sparing mastectomy. And at baseline, the cohorts were the same. But postoperatively, patients who underwent nipple sparing mastectomy had a higher score on the satisfaction with breast and satisfaction with outcome um, categories. And that was statistically significant. So there is a translation of improved outcomes following nipple areola complex preservation. And while all this may appear dry, I think pictures say more than a thousand words. If you compare the patient on the left-hand side who underwent left nipple sparing mastectomy with reconstruction using a 3 DIP flap, versus the right who underwent bilateral abdominal flap reconstruction with uh, following skin sparing mastectomy, it is very clear that the nipple sparing patient just looks more natural. Of course, you can uh, perform nipple areola complex uh, reconstruction secondarily, but those never look as natural as uh, the nipple areola complex that nature gave you. So knowing of the importance and the benefit of preserving the nipple areola complex, you have to ask yourself, why is it not offered wide, in, in a very widespread manner? And I think there's three reasons for that. Number one, oncologic factors or concerns related to the oncologic aspects of it. Uh, that is something that we may or may not be able to control as plastic surgeons. But the second big group are is related to the breast morphology, and that is breast ptosis and macromastia have been considered contraindications to nipple sparing mastectomy. And the reason for that uh, is related to concerns over nipple necrosis and nipple areola complex malposition. And naturally, none of us want to see something like this or something like this postoperatively. So how can we partner with the breast surgeons to reduce the likelihood of this happening? 
talking about nipple area really complex reconstruction first. Uh, whenever you talk about a problem, I think it is important to understand the the basics and pioneering work here has been done by uh, doctors Irene Wachner and Jeff Gertner, who looked at the perfusion patterns to the nipple areola complex using ICG imaging. And what they saw were three distinct perfusion patterns to the nipple areola complex. And they termed it V1, V2, and V3. And what we need to just take away from this is that V1 designates a direct blood supply from the underlying glandular tissue to the nipple areola complex, as opposed to V2 and V3, where you have more of a peripheral uh, perfusion that enters the nipple areola complex. And that is not just of academic interest, but has actually clinical implications as a patient who has been identified as having a V1 pattern, as in a direct blood supply directly from the glandular tissue, is going to have a higher risk, a greater risk of, un, of experiencing ischemic complications if you perform nipple sparing mastectomy in one stage. And uh, they were able to show that quite elegantly. So what that translated into was using ICG imaging as a guide to stage the process. And what that means is that if a patient is found to have a V1 pattern preoperatively, they undergo a nipple delay. At that point, they undergo their lumpectomy, they undergo their sentinel lymph node, they undergo their retroareolar biopsy, and then two to four weeks later, undergo nipple sparing mastectomy reconstruction. Versus if you're found to have a V2 or V3 pattern, you go directly to nipple sparing mastectomy and reconstruction. And that has uh, translated into a marked reduction in the uh, rate of uh, nipple necrosis here at Stanford. And I'm going to show uh, two patients that illustrate this algorithm. So this patient uh, obviously has significant ptosis, has large breasts, large areola. By all measures, she's a very poor candidate for nipple areola complex preservation. She desired to undergo bilateral mastectomy, and she was found to have a V1 pattern. So she underwent nipple delay first, and then nipple sparing mastectomy with reconstruction. She did not want to have a lift preoperatively or anything, but we were able to pretty closely match how she looked preoperatively and her nipple areola complex has survived. And you can see the absence of any um, pigment changes indicating the absence of an ischemic hit to the nipple areola complex. As opposed to this patient who had a V2 pattern, so a peripheral uh, perfusion predominantly to the NAC, and she underwent straight one stage nipple, areola, uh, uh, nipple sparing mastectomy bilaterally via IMF incisions. and free abdominal flap transfers. So having addressed the issues of nipple necrosis, the question now is nipple position, because a nipple areola complex that is not centered on the breast just doesn't look right. And it's sometimes even better to just not have uh, an NAC. This was a very, very uh, influential article for me. This was out of NYU by Mia Cho and Nolan Karp, who uh, have a tremendous experience on nipple sparing mastectomies and reconstruction. And uh, they commented on the rate of secondary uh, nipple areola complex uh, repositioning that was necessary in their cohort. Interestingly, no patient who had a distant history, basically unrelated to the mastectomy, who had a distant history of breast reduction or mastopexy required uh, repositioning of the NAC. So taking this information, you can then frame a concept whereby staged control of the nipple areola complex position and breast envelope has the potential to expand indications for nipple sparing mastectomy because conventionally uh, patients are offered nipple sparing mastectomy if they have uh, small to moderate sized breasts and no ptosis. But we can expand that population perhaps. And uh, the Initial report on this concept of staging it was introduced in 2012 by the late Scott Spear, but that was more focused on implant-based reconstruction. Um, we wanted to see and determine if oncoplastic procedures in preparation for nipple sparing mastectomy would allow patients to be offered NAC preservation, who otherwise would have been offered skin sparing mastectomy only. And this was the algorithm that we offered essentially examining the patient, whether they had breast ptosis or macromastia, and if so, they would undergo stage one, oncoplastic mastopexy or reduction, and then stage two, nipple sparing mastectomy with immediate reconstruction. And this patient illustrates that case or that approach. This is a 49-year-old patient who has left 
uh, upper outer quadrant breast cancer. She underwent wire localized uh, lumpectomy with mastopexy. So this is her preoperatively. This is her after lumpectomy and mastopexy. And at this point, the tumor margins are clear. She could just say she does not want to proceed with mastectomy anymore, and she can just proceed with breast conservation radiation and be done with it. But this particular patient wanted to proceed with nipple sparing mastectomy and underwent reconstruction with abdominal flap reconstruction. And because we preoperatively set the NACs and control the skin envelope, at the time of the mastectomy with reconstruction, it is then quite easy to achieve reasonable outcomes because of the various variables that you want to influence, you're just addressing volume. This patient obviously represents a, a, a more higher stakes candidate. Why? She's a young woman, she has large breasts, um, and she is a prophylactic patient. And so, if you perform nipple sparing mastectomy in one stage, it's probably going to fail more likely than not. So what we did here was a vertical mastopexy first and then proceeded with bilateral abdominal flap based reconstruction and the monitor skin islands here along the vertical incision will be excised secondarily so that her breast appearance will be that of a patient who underwent mastopexy only uh, without any evidence of her being a mastectomy patient. An older woman, 57-year-old, who underwent uh, a previous lumpectomy on the right-hand side. She has some nipple asymmetry. She wanted to also be substantially smaller. So in her, we did reduction followed by bilateral abdominal flap-based reconstruction. And again, the ability to set the nipple areola complex and control the envelope just gives you more control over the breast shape in total. So what were our results? So we looked at 61 patients who were enrolled in, in this study, so 122 flaps. Uh, folks who had um, cancer diagnosis obviously were older, and the interval between stage one and stage two was substantially longer in the prophylactic population. We did see, uh, we did see uh, patients who developed complications, specifically partial NAC necrosis, an 8% complete and 6% and malposition in, in one patient, these numbers uh, essentially mirror numbers of studies that talk about complication rates following nipple sparing mastectomy in ideal patients. And just as a reminder, none of these patients probably would have been offered nipple sparing mastectomy based on conventional criteria. So here we have essentially a over 90 plus percent salvage of the NAC in patients who otherwise would have not been offered NAC preservation to begin with. Complications do happen, however. So in this patient who presented for a prophylactic mastectomy, she had undergone mastopexy and then she developed bilateral uh, partial nipple areola complex necrosis. But the important thing to consider is that a lot of times the NACs pull through and all you then need to do is to address the um, pigment changes and that can be touched up with tattooing and they can then have pretty natural looking nipple areola complexes. Or uh, this patient, 41 year old, also prophylactic, who underwent mastopexy, had some nipple necrosis postoperatively, but again, that results in somewhat flattening of the nipple and pigment changes, but that again can be addressed with tattooing secondarily, and the overall shape of the breast has been improved compared to preoperatively. So when you look at this initial algorithm that we had, we have expanded this now by looking at breast morphology that guides our decision making as to performing uh, breast shaping procedures first, and then performing delay yes or no. So obviously this increases the stages or, or adds to the stages, but I think ultimately results in an improved aesthetic outcome for patients. So the change in this, in our practice, has been that implementation of this algorithm has certainly increased the percentage of patients being offered nipple sparing mastectomy with, at present, over 80% of patients that I see are offered nipple sparing approaches, which is substantially higher than the national average when you look at uh, the registries that are uh, available to us. The next uh, two pain points that I had mentioned at the outset is high abdominal scar and poor projection. And I think this case illustrates it quite nicely. This was a 29-year-old 
uh, patient who had a history of granulomatous mastitis with numerous abscess formations and INDs in the ER uh, and hospitalizations, and she eventually just wanted to undergo bilateral lymphosparing sparing mastectomy and reconstruction. And so we did that. We did uh, an abdominal flat-based reconstruction bilaterally, and this is how she looks postoperatively. And I would argue that we were able to pretty much get close to how she looked pre-op. But when you just go one level lower and you look at that scar, then you're like, ooh, that probably doesn't look too good. And the reason why it's so disruptive and, and doesn't look that good is because you have a very short distance between the nipple, uh, between the umbilicus to the abdominal scar. And the reason for that is because of a traditional flap design whereby the upper border of the abdominal flap courses above the level of the umbilicus. And so I asked myself, am I an outlier? I had a series of patients who looked like that with a high riding abdominal scar, tight abdomen. And I looked in the literature and certainly there is article over article um, that has been published by pioneers in the field whereby the abdominal scar is quite high and the distance between the umbilicus and the abdomen is rather short. And so I thought, and certainly uh, I didn't come up with this, other authors have um, reported this, is by dropping the upper incision down, you're increasing the distance between the umbilicus to the abdominal scar and it makes for a more harmonious appearing abdomen. There is a problem with that, however. If you take a standard flap marking, and you drop it down, what you're then potentially missing out is the soft tissue in along that upper border. And so you have a flap that is, uh, has less volume than you uh, ordinarily would have. And that is also well known. We know that the low DIP flap, uh, the volume of it tends to be smaller. And in those cases, I believe that adding an implant and offering patients hybrid reconstruction is a valuable concept. Why? Because patients do live with the scar uh, forever. And anything that we can do to drop the scar, I think at least should be considered and discussed with the patient. So the lower abdominal scar that um, results following hybrid reconstruction is I think one of the upsides of this reconstructive mortality. It is not a new concept to combining flaps and implants. That was reported in the 90s, again in the early 2000s, and then 2010. Um, but authors have commented on the difficulty of maintaining implant position and, and problems with the implant in general. And so why am I now uh, promoting this or, or speaking in favor of this reconstructive modality? Well, we now have uh, tools in our armamentarium that allow us to control the implant position. And this is basically now a reflection of the journey that I went through uh, with uh, one of my close friends and colleagues, Dr. Controla, who, um, uh, where basically we, we uh, saw a transition in our surgical technique and an evolution in how we offer hybrid reconstruction. So this was the first article that uh, we published on this. And the big difference between this and the preceding articles is the use of mesh, some type of mesh material, whether ADM or Vicrol, to just control the implant position and take that variable out of the equation. And here initially, I did what I was trained to do. You place the implant under the pec and you place the flap on top. So that's what we did. So it was a dual plane uh, implant insertion followed by a uh, flap transfer on top of it. And while the results were okay, the problem was animation deformity. And that is obviously incredibly frustrating if you go through a bilateral free flap and uh, you then have animation. And so that then resulted in a translation of planes um, whereby everything is done uh, pre pec So this illustration demonstrates the differences of augmentation, implant reconstruction, and hybrid reconstruction. And why am I putting it up there? We do know that patients who undergo breast augmentation have substantially better outcomes long-term than those who undergo implant-based reconstruction. The implants that we use are the same, but the differences are, number one, the quality of soft tissue coverage, and number two, the ratio between foreign body to total breast volume. 
So the greater the volume of the implant is relative to the total breast volume, the less favorable the long-term outcomes will be. And if you look at the cross-section of the hybrid reconstruction, it anatomically resembles that of an augmentation rather than that of a reconstruction. And this superior soft tissue coverage is actually also seen on imaging where you can see really a thick soft tissue flap covering the implant. And the implant is truly used to give you projection. And there is no way that you can do implant-based reconstruction and fat graft the soft tissue envelope to this level. That's practically impossible. So whenever you talk about something new in your mind, you get quite excited and you want to offer it to everybody, but it behooves us to take a step back and look at who are the patients that would benefit of it the most? In other words, what is the indication for this procedure? And I think this patient best exemplifies this. So there is some abdominal skin laxity, um, but there is insufficient volume to match the current or desired breast volume. And the patient does, uh, desires to undergo improvement of her abdominal contour. And taking those two together, <clears throat> I think make for a good patient. I think, um, uh, what what is uh, at times um, uh, unfortunate is when you see patients being offered implant-based reconstruction and then you're being told that we're so happy they now want to have an abdominal plasty as well. Well, you could have used the tissue resulting from the abdominal plasty to, uh, for the purpose of breast reconstruction. So this approach, hybrid reconstruction, does not take anything away from free flap breast reconstruction. It truly expands the indications for microsurgical breast reconstruction. It truly increases the pie. And it's technically quite simple. So this is after the flap has been transferred to the chest, the anastomosis has been done. And then I take the implant wrapped in ABM, uh, put it under the flap. You then wanna obviously take a look at the pedicle, make sure the pedicle glides uh, smoothly over the um, uh, implant construct. Then you secure the ADM that surrounds the implant to the chest wall exactly where you want it. And that just takes one or two, sometimes three stitches, and that locks the implant in place. And then you take the um, flap and you drape it over the implant, essentially providing circumferential coverage of the implant um, all the way around, starting medially, laterally, and then um, inferiorly as well. And once you have that, you basically have a situation where you don't need to place any coning stitches into the flap. The coning is already happening because of the implant being there. So that is truly the framework of your reconstruction. And you now have several centimeters of soft tissue thickness on top of it. And this is a patient supine and you already have a projecting breast. And so the evolution uh, in uh, my practice has been away from subpectoral device insertion all to prepec. And here you can see the differences in projection with a patient supine. And this is with the implant, obviously, this is without, and there's no way that you can comb this flap to look like this without narrowing the base uh, to the point where it becomes aesthetically unappealing. And so overall, it is technically quite simple and it does improve projection. And here are just a few case examples. So a 47-year-old who had right DCIS, and postoperatively, she is fuller, she wanted to be fuller. Arguably, that patient could have also been offered implant-based reconstruction, but she wanted to use her abdominal tissue. This patient, 48-year-old, underwent bilateral nipple sparing mastectomy and free flaps with implants. And the implant volume is at most maybe 250, but typically in the 160 to 240 range. 49-year-old, again, large breast, but wanted to be at least as large, and she did have abdominal tissue, but not enough to give her that volume. So we did bilateral free flap transfer with small implants, 175. Complications do happen, however, and you can truly push the envelope, no pun intended, uh, whereby you just generate, uh, if you will, iatrogenic problems. And this patient illustrates that, where you can just overshoot. And so what happened here? This patient had a flap that weighed 400 gram. The mastectomy specimen on each side was less than 200. But then I thought because of the skin laxity, I would be able to place an additional small implant. It was really a small implant, 440 cc's. The problem was that the outcome was disastrous in the sense that there was a large area of mastectomy skin necrosis on the right side. 
So what do you do now? You have an area of necrosis over an implant, but fortunately, because the area of necrosis is separated from the implant by your flap, all I did was just local wound care. It took some patience on part of the patient and a lot of hand-holding, but ultimately we nursed her along and she healed. While the aesthetic appearance is not great, certainly not, but the shape was at least preserved and uh, she did not need any further uh, procedures. And so this is her pre and this is her after healing. And again, it was one operation. Again, I acknowledge that this doesn't look great, um, but these are complications that can happen if you're overly zealous about it. So what are outcomes with this? Um, in uh, our early series of 57 patients and 114 flaps, uh, we were able to successfully address the main issue and that is related to flap loss. And we didn't see a flap loss just because you have full control over the pedicle. So that is not something that folks should be concerned about. We did see a mastectomy skin necrosis rate of 14%, however, and that too is pretty much on par with non-hybrid uh, approaches, as in if you just do a flat base reconstruction, there are reports that uh, reflect a mastectomy skin necrosis anywhere between 10 to up to 20 percent. So I think it is safe to conclude to say that uh, this reconstructive modality is quite safe. But there are challenging patients, such as this one that I had presented earlier. So this was a 43-year-old woman who had a history of bilateral breast augmentation. She had left breast cancer. She wanted to preserve her nipple area with conflict. She wanted to use her own tissue from the abdomen because she desired some improvement there. She wanted to be bigger, but couldn't tell me how much bigger. And so that poses a little bit of a treatment dilemma. So how do you address it? And, and this is then what I offered, which was a bilateral tissue expander placement. I expanded the patient until she was happy with the size of the breast. At that point, I knew the total volume that I needed. I then harvested the flap, weighed the flap, and took the difference between the two to make up using an implant. And so this is her pre-op, this is her following expansion, and arguably you could just put in an implant, and that was something that was discussed, but the patient wished to use her abdominal tissue as well. And so this is her then after bilateral uh, DIP flaps with small 180 cc implants. And looking at this delayed immediate hybrid approach, uh, we uh, had uh, 31 patients, so uh, 62 flaps. And here too, we did not see um, any flap losses. But importantly, while we did see a 13% um, rate of mastectomy skin necrosis after stage one, which is fine because you can excise, uh, deflate the expander, close and re-expand, after stage two, we did not see any mastectomy skin necrosis, and that is the result that the patients are left with. And so that was, I believe, an advancement in, in, in our algorithm and how we uh, approach these uh, more challenging cases. So in summary, hybrid reconstruction allows for lower scar placement. It allows for superior soft tissue coverage and expands the indications of microsurgical reconstruction. And it is technically simple, as I was hopefully able to show, and it does improve the projection of the reconstructive breast. And with the addition of delayed immediate hybrid approaches, you definitely reduce the rate of mastectomy skin necrosis at the time of your flap transfer. And it increases the predictability of outcome because it takes the uncertainty out of the equation with respect to how large of an implant do you place. <clears throat> and, and I believe that patient satisfaction tends to increase as well because they just have more buy-in. So overall, it allows for an individualized approach based on patient preferences rather than anatomical restrictions. The last point that I want to address is restoring sensation. And um, we do know that sensation is one of the uh, goals of breast reconstruction, however, a goal that we have largely ignored in the past. And it was uh, not until uh, this article out of the New York Times uh, took center stage in mainstream media where uh, mastectomies were associated with an unexpected blow, uh, that uh, something that was unappreciated uh, by surgeons preoperatively and unmet by contemporary surgical technique. And one of our prominent um, colleagues, Dr. Pusick, uh, talked about the next frontier in breast reconstruction, legitimately so. And so <clears throat> let me make a plug uh, for uh, the importance of sensory recovery, just to kind of um, uh, 
adjust the way how we look at this. If you look at this patient, this is a patient of mine who came to the ER, had a uh, avascular digit, and ultimately I was able to put it together. Uh, you sew the vessels, but if you ignore repairing the nerves, that's practically malpractice. Or if you have something like this, uh, forearm defect, and you just were to cover the defect without addressing the uh, uh, nerve component to it, you basically have an insensate limb. And so you want to preserve um, nerve sensation, you want to uh, preserve motor function, you want to cover soft tissue. Um, a case I did with uh, Dr. Safa in residency um, was this, and obviously he's a world expert in transgender surgery um, and is an incredible surgeon, but if he were to ignore uh, connecting the nerves at the time of the uh, radial flap transfer, that would probably not echo well or resonate well with his patient. So then if you put it all together, the question then becomes, why not routinely do within these patients as well? You do see sensory nerve fibers on the abdomen when you uh, raise the flap, and you do see nerves uh, at the recipient side. So it is technically very easy to do, and it really doesn't add too much to the operation. And the reason why I say that is, uh, aside of a philosophical uh, approach to it, that structures that are deliberately cut should, if possible, be repaired, there are some practical implications for patients. The insensitivity of the reconstructed breast can result in thermal injuries, and there's a number of articles uh, commenting on this. There's obviously a variety of options for uh, flap neurotization that I'm not going to go into, but what I'm going to present what I do uh, in my practice. Uh, we performed a systematic review looking at all articles that were published on this topic, and we were not able to perform a rigorous meta-analysis as in the quantitative analysis of the outcomes because of the heterogeneity of the data. But what we did see was that innervated flaps or neurotized flaps do appear to show earlier recovery of sensation and an improved quality and quantity of sensation. So leveraging the existing uh, literature, we sought out to develop a surgical technique that is simple, that doesn't add donor site morbidity, that allows selective coaptation to sensory nerve fibers, that prevents axonal loss, and permits tensionless repair. And I'm going to walk you through uh, the way that we do it here. And so this is standard flap markings. Uh, this is uh, the flap marking here is in the era before I dropped it to below the umbilicus. Um, you elevate the flap in standard manner, and you will see the nerves every single time, if you just look for them, emanate from the anterior rectus sheath. After you've identified them, you basically pick the nerve that you want, and now comes the critical part, is you don't dissect the nerve all the way uh, through the muscle and back, you just dissect it uh, back to the V point where the sensory branch connects with the motor branch, and you clip it distal to that. And sometimes the nerve just runs on top of the muscle and right when it dives down, that's when you clip it. And you know that you just have the sensory component. So it is technically very simple. Once you have cut it, you will typically have a two, maybe 2.5 centimeter nerve stump. And that mandates then the need for something to bridge the gap between this nerve stump and the recipient nerve in the chest. And what I use is a nerve allograph. And by way of having this short nerve stump, you can selectively co-op nerves uh, to the sensory component only. And this is how a typical flap looks on the back table. So you have your perforator entering the flap and you have a short nerve stump going away from it. But then I have friends and colleagues who tell me I can raise it with a very long nerve. And I say, well, I could too, and that is totally fine. The problem is, though, that if you go through the technical exercise of performing a DIP flap, and you then, though, raise a long intercostal segment, you've effectively denervated um, at least parts of the muscle, unnecessarily so. And so that's one part, as in you're increasing morbidity. And the second reason is that if you have something like this and you then co opt it, you can have axonal loss. And so that's not something that I do or uh, promote. And so the reduction of donor site morbidity and prevention of axonal loss are two reasons why I just keep the nerve stump rather short and limited to this um, sensory branch only. As it pertains to the recipient site, um, 
there is two different camps, if you will. You can use the medial uh, intercostal uh, uh, or the lateral branch, and there's pros and cons to both. If you take the medial, it is consistent, it is reliable, it is in your field where you have the internal mammary vessels. It is incredibly fast. The downside is that it is a smaller nerve, and it is not the primary nerve to the NAC. Uh, the lateral one is the main nerve to the NAC at baseline. It, it is larger, but um, it is oftentimes injured during the mastectomy. It is at times difficult to identify in delayed reconstruction. And because now you have two points of connection, as in laterally to the nerve and medially to the vessels, I believe sometimes it is difficult to shape the flap the way you want to. And as a result, I typically go um, to the medial uh, intercostal. And so the steps are very standard. You uh, just, uh, you know, sometimes I do it rib sparing, but mostly I take the rib cartilage out, and this is then how you look. So everything is neatly positioned in your surgical field. You then uh, use the nerve allograft. I typically use a one to two by 50 uh, millimeters, and then I trim it after I have uh, the flap up to minimize the length of the nerve allograft for a more expedient sensory recovery. You then perform your vascular anastomosis, and then you perform your distal nerve coaptation, and that essentially is it. So you just place two stitches, and uh, it really doesn't add anything to the operation, and it allows for a tensionless nerve coaptation. Sometimes you do have a size discrepancy between the allograft and the uh, intercostal nerve, and there's a variety of ways how you can overcome it, and what I typically do is I use a segment of the SIEB that is obviously always there, or almost always there, and I use that as a connector, if you will. So you just intubate it, you pull it through, then you do your nerve coaptation, you put it over, and then you secure it with a stitch, and then and additionally maybe a clip. So the same way that you would do it with a connector. And sometimes you have two nerve ends in the field, and you can plug both of them into the allograft and do the same with the um, SIAB uh, vein wrap, if you will. So what about outcomes? So if you do all this, you obviously have to measure what you do as, as opposed to just doing it uh, to um, demonstrate that you can technically do it. And that is currently being tracked. This is an industry sponsored, uh, sponsored by Oxygen, um, a uh, prospective um, outcomes registry. It's multi-centered. We currently have 16 active sites. <clears throat> and at predefined intervals, uh, patients are uh, examined for sensation as displayed here. So uh, distinct uh, quadrants of the breasts and distinct sites are examined. And the uh, long-term outcomes, all of these are preliminary because uh, patients are still being uh, recruited, uh, were as follows. And this was presented at the 2020 uh, ASRM annual meeting, whereby uh, patients who underwent neurotized flaps had uh, a greater likelihood of having more than half of the flap regain protective sensation at one year, as in 20% of the flaps um, had more than half of their flap area have uh, protective sensation as opposed to just 6%. In other words, also the uh, controlled, as in those who did not have any uh, flap neurotization, uh, over 60% practically had no sensation at all after a year that is zero to one so on and while the results were statistically significant we're still in continuing the investigations in collaboration with the various sites across the u.s so if you put it then together here is uh the proposed approach is technically quite simple i would say i don't believe it increases morbidity and it addresses all the uh, characteristics that we sought it out to address and uh it is important to highlight that the early clinical outcomes are indicative of superior um, sensory recovery, but the clinical investigation is still ongoing, so stay tuned for that. So now when you put it all together, uh, how do you address a patient such as this one, a 41-year-old BRCA1 mutation with ptosis, and she wants it all. She wants to preserve her nipples. She wants to have perkier looking breast, and she ideally would like to have uh, the option for sensory recovery or improved sensory recovery. So what we did was a bilateral mastopexy as a first stage, followed by nipple sparing mastectomy and bilateral neurotized DIP flaps with 160 cc implants. And she will eventually undergo excision of the monitor skin islands along the vertical uh, incision. And so you will not see any evidence of a flap or mastectomy in this patient long term. 
So when you now summarize it all, I think that breast reconstruction approaches continue to evolve. Um, and I cannot uh, overstate the importance of cross-specialty collaboration. I wouldn't be able to do this without my colleagues uh, from breast surgery. And I think that we should encourage our trainees and our peers to uh, question our current practice and to challenge us. Whenever you try something new, it is always good to have friends uh, challenge what you do. And I certainly have had my fair share of discussions with my friends uh, up at the Bunky Clinic who uh, are obviously uh, wizards of microsurgery and I have benefited tremendously throughout my career from. And with that, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Arash, uh, for an incredible talk. Um, you've really kind of refined a lot of the things we've seen with breast reconstruction from uh, from, a, from an aesthetic standpoint, from a, from a functional standpoint as well. Uh, first of all, I think your your results are um, are really beautiful. I mean, I think just aesthetically very pleasing results. And I think, you know, we see a lot of um, breast presentations, but I think most of them don't really have the aesthetics um, that I've seen in your cases. And a lot of them very, very challenging cases too. So con congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of questions. So the hybrid breast reconstruction, um, I think, is something that you've definitely kind of um, promoted and, and showed some fantastic results with. I noticed that you um, enveloped the implant in ADM. Can you tell us a little, little bit about the rationale for that and why you do it? Sure. So I initially, when I started doing it, I used micro mesh or ADM, basically whatever I would get my hands on quicker. And uh, what I've seen now over the years is that patients in whom I had used Vicro, <clears throat> they have developed capsule contraction for whatever reason. I think it does make sense because Vicro goes away after a few weeks and then you basically just have scar left and in some patients that can then translate into Capcom. So I have gone back and have done capsulectomies and the like to, to address the capsule contracture as opposed to following ADM utilization. I have yet to see a patient with Capcom following the reconstruction. That's one reason. The second one is a simple, um, it's a very uh, pragmatic one, and that is when you have uh, an implant that is wrapped in Vicryl, the pedicle tends to stick to it a little bit more, as opposed to the pedicle glides very nicely over the ADM. And so I find that it gives me a little bit more of a safety margin. So one is the at the time of uh, implant insertion where the pedicle doesn't stick to the construct, that's why I use ADM, but more importantly, it is the long-term outcome as in minimization of capsular contraction. Got it. Um, so kind of along the same lines, um, let's say you're doing that last case you showed, a, a bilateral um, deep flap with implants, let's say, that are wrapped in ADM and then neurotized with two allografts. Um, so these are obviously not inexpensive operations. Are you getting any pushback from either the hospital or the insurance company? So far, no. So we obviously obtain a pre-authorization for all of these operations, and so we submit the codes. It is very infrequent that uh, an insurance company uh, questions the, utiliza the uh, utilization of nerve allografts. They practically never have pushed back on the ADM and implant piece of it. But then when you do a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, they uh, so far have approved the use of nerve allograft. So no, it, it, at most the pushback has been from insurance, but certainly not from the hospital. Got it. And then in that case where you did the the mastopexy first and then went back and did the re reconstruction, what was the interval between the mast mastopexy and the inter and the reconstruction? Or was there any oncologic concern about delaying the the resection? Right. So uh, that's that's a very important question, and and um, that commonly comes up. If you look at the um, sequence of treatment of patients with breast cancer, so first of all, in a prophylactic setting, you have as much time as you want. Um, you can wait for three months, you can wait for six months, that's not going to be an issue. The challenge happens in patients with cancer because you don't want to delay their oncologic care. If you perform, let's say, just lumpectomy, so in a breast-conserving case, just lumpectomy and radiation, the radiation happens typically six weeks, sometimes longer, after surgery. And so in, in those patients, we wait for at least eight weeks. Um, so we do the lumpectomy, we do the oncoplastic reduction or, or mastopexy, mm -hmm. 
And, and the patient at this point is tumor free. So there's no active tumor by definition, by pathology in the patient. The patient can still say, I don't want to proceed with mastectomy. I just want to do radiation at the eight week mark. Mm -hmm. So we can safely push the second stage out to there. And then we talk to the radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist. We have been able to push it out up to 12 weeks, but not much more than that. So I would say two to three months is reasonable. And that would also fall in line if they were to proceed routinely per schedule if they had uh, chosen to proceed with breast conservation. So I don't think that that added stage adds length uh, to their oncologic care. Got it. And then the uh, the last question that I have is regarding the um, innervation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you showed a case where you used two nerves instead of one. Um, when do you decide to do one nerve versus two? Is it just, just the size, just kind of a general hunch, or is there something yeah. objective about it? I, I, I think that... I think that if you're honest about it, we don't know, right? We just don't know uh, what the right or wrong answer is. The when, If I have a good size match, if I have a one-to-one -one match, and I'm just going to use one nerve and that's it. I will use two nerves if the two nerves are in the vicinity to each other, in close proximity. And if putting both nerves together matches the, the diameter of the nerve allograft. The nerve allografts tend to be a little bit larger in diameter than the intercostal nerves, at least the medial ones. Not so much the lateral ones, but the medial ones. Mm -hmm. And if I then have another nerve that I can plug into, then I will do that. Um, we're tracking it, so hopefully in a year, two years, I will be able to tease out what is better and what is not. Mm -hmm. But the, right now, the way it is, it is a very pragmatic approach. I see one or two nerve endings, I can put them together, and, and that's what I do at the time of surgery. Great. Th thanks for that. Uh, well, Arash, um, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Really enjoyed it um, and actually learned quite a bit. And um, you're really kind of pushing the envelope, if you will, no pun intended, uh, with all the advancements with um, the, the aesthetic considerations of the donor site, um, in improving projection by using hybrid breast reconstruction, um, re innervation of the breast for better function. Uh, so I want to con congratulate you on that, and and um, I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to see you in person soon. <laughs> thanks. Same here. Thanks so much, right. everybody. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much. You. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks.